be back in this isolated space now from the rest of the universe. <laughs> As I described, if you'd like to say the Doctor Who. Um, I believe the watchword for this conference is Ah, uh, get us. <laughs>
lines in my pizza side of the door. He, he actually phoned up to check. And he'd been told it was five foot four as well. But I convinced him, so I got the lobby. And the more I lied, the more he lasted. I came back, I went from the colony to the Canary Islands, and I've been, I've been working in the long working permit, working for the permit, because I'm now any English ancestors or whatever, a long way back, I don't qualify to have the answer of this. So, I don't know if I've ever been able to spend time with them, so we go out to the country and come back in on these, these working holiday permits. And, uh, anyway, I have one of these, and I'm doing the struggles. And I thought, I came back to the Canaries and I thought, oh, well, I'll just go to the family house and give the issue with this family house, these uh, photograph things. I just let all these four hours pass and were very discreet. And I'll get another 12 months. <laughs> so it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was, luckily there was this huge plane of Americans in Brown just before we had. And uh, I, got, I had to finally go up to the top of the Pure Teacher. And uh, very exhausted immigration officials. I look at the bank card, all out, his eyes lit up. He said, You can't do this job on this permit. This is totally illegal. So it's sort of, it's sort of, I said, Well, in fact, I said, I recorded story four, which was for Tuesday, and I recorded story two, which, is, uh, which was um, invitation. I said, I haven't had a story in one year, and it cost me a lot of money to get me out of the country. <laughs> so we set up my passport for two months and sent me, sent me back to the BBC with a sort of long form and I had to fill out to get permission to actually work on the program. It's a little bit rough, really. I'm not flying by the seat of your pants. <laughs> so John, John sort of, and my attention to work together a lot, the producer John Lincoln Turner, worked together a lot at the fan conferences. And the reason why I'm wearing a Ryan print, those of you who don't know, the Ryan print is on his trademark. And I'm always very derogatory, you know, making very derogatory comments about them. But as I haven't got the other half of my carpet here today, because we always do a sort of um, do panel sessions together where we're very rude to each other. And uh, do a duet and a you know, we should do a camera at night, but this would be a duet, so you know, once again very rude to each other. So I've come full dressed as John Lake and Tom <laughs> We don't feel that we've missed out on the other half, totally. I suppose I'll be answering questions from you all over the weekend and uh, chatting to all this week here. And lovely the convention is, is, is contained enough to, to do uh, autographs for the and things like that. Because it's terrible about it when you heard hear about the convention that we didn't follow it. It was a massive convention that we did down in, in the West Country at the other end because of most of you probably know a huge state of And the BBC thought that they'd get 15,000 people over two days. So they geared up for this. And uh, they actually got 70,000 people over two days. And you had to go everywhere. Two soldiers in front of two soldiers behind and a soldier on the side. Um, and it was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen people queuing for all the for five hours. By the time they got to the head of the queue, the people that they've been queuing for long since long, and we're doing other things around the place. Mark Strickson and I were sort of going up and down the queues in his jeeps, sort of signing autographs for people to try and keep them from rioting. <laughs> Absolute chaos. So, thankfully, it's not going to be like that. One of the leading figures from Adelphi, which is probably about 5,000 people. And that's going to be a very nice one. It was a much more contained novel, which is wonderful. Um, I hope uh, you will enjoy the convention very much this weekend and you have a good time. I know I hope you will. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to stop shouting. My tape just brought tears to the eye. My eyes are streaming. They're so cold. It's awful. It's beautiful. It's always cold when you're filming. The eye of Orion, freezing. Absolutely freezing. It's a hilltop in Wales. And uh, those ruins were actually a gift from the local population. They were given to, um, to the family for their silver wedding anniversary or something. People were in that, that uh, estate. And he asked the 
travel agents that essentially was asked what he liked from from his little way of luxury from his tent and, and they he said a ruin. And that's what the Isle of Arran is. It's a ruin on on, on Hilltop in Wales. And that costume which looks that big bulky coat that I was wearing, which looks so warm, wrong. <laughs> wrong. It's not even lined, you know, but it's just a sort of synthetic material. I keep on walking around saying, hello, real me. <laughs> At least I walk. Anybody else got a question? Yeah. Why did you work for the That's right, yeah. Yeah, I worked for the public theatre for a year, uh, from mid-75 to mid-76. I was one of the original group, I think, joined, there were two, um, two people left. Maggie Bonhorst and um, Cap Ball left, and I joined after that. So it was nice because I had the year before I left Australia, I sort of toured all up and down the East Coast, which was just wonderful. I had a wonderful year. You notice it is life, really. It's great. Anybody else have a question? Now, you must be curious about fun effects that have to do with the hair and shape. Any amusing anecdotes? Oh yeah, plenty. <laughs> Actually, it's always funny because you think I must write them down. A lot of them are for publication. <laughs> that people getting their lines wrong, substituting rude words instead. <laughs> um, sort of a fave, my fave. Well, it's Peter Davis is a favourite actually. You know that awful costume I wore, that that bonus top, that corset thing. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> Awful, and I didn't stop being vain about that costume the whole year. I'd never let up. You only have to mention that costume now, and John Edward Tony goes, Oh, please go start off, please go start off. And it's, uh, it was a, originally it was bone right down over the hips, and it kept on riding up, so I had this sort of fin in the front. <laughs> and the side they had chopped it off, and they chopped off all the bones. And they'd only just finished it before we went to Amsterdam filming. And not only was it freezing cold in Amsterdam, and I'm in this little light costume, but the, the, um, the bodice top, the, the bones where they've been cut off, were coming through their casings, and they rubbed, they rubbed sores all around my waist. I had sort of a nice fine set of, it looks as though I've been wearing sort of, you know, a newer bird maiden or something. And the shoes we bought, because I have very small feet, they're quite wide, so that we've gone out shopping for shoes. I said to the costume lady, no, it's the early hour the whole day. And we did it the Friday afternoon, we were flying up, I think it was Monday morning. And uh, she allowed two hours. I said, it won't be enough time, believe me. And it wasn't. So I had to make do with these shoes. And they, and they were a leather weave, and the, 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 the leather was very tough. And then rubbed right through my feet, so my feet were bleeding. My waist was bleeding. I was desperately uncomfortable. But anyway, I'll, I was wearing that costume on snake dogs. And he thinks, and I come down from the bar at lunchtime. And I was thinking, I had to record that sequence, you know, at the end where I, I go loony. <laughs> possessed by the bar. Absolutely possessed. So I was thinking about that. I really wasn't concentrating on the conversation. And, uh, I got down, my dressing room was next to his, and he said, put your bag down, Jan. So I did. He said, now lift your hands up. And out I popped. <laughs> and as I did it, all the cameramen came through the front of the And a whole set of technicians came to the front of the other side. And Peter took off like three stars. <laughs> laughing so much. I quickly put myself back into my costume and chased him into the makeup room. He didn't put makeup on him for 15 minutes he was laughing so hard. And I got onto the studio floor and all the camera were laughing, because we always had the same camera crew. And they were all laughing and saying, didn't think you'd make a boo like that, Jess. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh God, do me a favor. They look up around, you know, follow me up. It's terrible. Peter wasn't terribly bad about practical jokes, but Colin, Colin is dreadful. He loves practical jokes. He just adores them. He's always getting their own back on you. Anybody else have a question? What's and really inside the blue box? What's really inside the blue box? The blue box is extremely smelly. <laughs> it smells very musty. 
and they move these black drapes that sort of ring over that you can't see anything. And they always, I don't know where they hang them, they really stink. They sort of, do you know that when the fabric gets damp and it sort of doesn't dry out properly and it's left around? What's like that? It's really sort of musty smell. And it's so complicated because if, if you get a whole group of you having to go into the town and sort of shut the hell out of it, they try and find a way so that we can, some of us can get out the back door without being seen through the camera doors and without, oh, it's just impossible. Utterly impossible. So you've got to, you've got to find a way to shut it out and hang against the back wall of the towers, you know, so that you're not picked up from the camera. Camera. Drives me nuts. Anybody else have a question? Are any special effects or any the stories we did for five doctors any of that? Uh, you can think of more questions for the next panel session. Anybody got a question for me? I um, I hated most of my costumes to be honest. I thought they were awful. Um, and John had very fixed ideas about, about my costumes, and he really basically wanted them as low cut as possible and as short as possible. And I said, well, why don't you wear a band-aid? Anyway, because they were getting ridiculous. Uh, and it's very hard to be doing action spirits. John, everybody was around everywhere in high heels. Me never to be allowed to wear boots. You were never allowed to wear boots, because uh, you couldn't see your legs, which I was considered an advantage. And uh, also, they just were, they were never warm. And, and uh, you were always out filming somewhere really cold. And you could never put on, you probably noticed, I mean, unlike other television series, A, there's no furniture in the towers, and B, there's no way to hang a coat. You never seem to get to put a coat on, take it off. There's never any time you're always rushing after something. I mean, I've had some terrible running for costumes. <laughs> I, I quite like two costumes. One, that last costume I wore, the leather skirt with the belt draped over it, which um, I bought the belt over here to wash them, actually. And I chose that costume. And the other one was, John stuck me in these costumes for, like, you know, story after story. And at the end of uh, my second season, he sort of said, oh, right, um, go out and choose a costume. And I got the costume designer aside and I said, listen, let's not do any drawings or anything, let's just go shopping. And uh, so we went to a shop called Bastet in the in the of Marlowe and High Street, sort of trendy shop. And I chose the dress that I found had so many colours in it, there was no way I could wear it all the time because we use a, a device for a lot of our special effects, which is called the BBC colour separation overlay or commercial towers called chroma key, which is where you'll take out all the blue in a picture and you can superimpose the background. So you go and stand in a blue area and do whatever you want, you know, have to do. And then they, they put in a they fill in the rest of the picture with something that's in a totally separate corner of the studio. Um, for instance the Matrix um, in that story of Gonga, the one we filmed in Amsterdam. That was done like that. That was CSO. And of course, this dress that I chose had every possible CSO colour in it. Because I mean, usually you use blue, but you can use green, or you can use yellow, or you can use red. And this had all of those colours in it. So it was obvious I couldn't wear it for too many stories <laughs> because there was no way they could use them for special effects. So that was excellent as far as I was concerned. The next costume I got was from the colour, or the same time was designed to design a costume similar to the one here. Yeah, that's that little one, that tiny little pack that I wore the five doctors. Yeah, that was that was the costume designers. They made that one up. I didn't think that ever worked as well as the other one. I'm sure I'm going to brag the other one. Looks cheerier. Yeah, anybody else have questions? Yeah. Okay, maybe start with the actors. Is it safe playing England? Are they going to be asked to transport the ass or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the walk. Uh, I asked at my first year, I went over to England for a four month holiday. And we took a, it was a working holiday, we took a show over to the popular theatre troupe, which existed here. 
And uh, we toured around to Manchester and Liverpool and Bradford and Leeds and all those sorts of places. And we did um, a couple of seasons in London at the Round House. And I got off work with Ken Campbell, who runs the science, who used to run the science section here at Liverpool. And at the end of my first year there, we did a 24 hour show called Walk, and it was um, unbelievable. Because Ken, Ken sort of started out doing his long shows, he did an eight hour show called Illuminatus, which opened the Cosmo in the National. I suppose a lot of you actually know the Illuminatus trilogy, don't you? Do you? It's quite a few of you all, because it's. Um, he, he did the first production of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as well, yeah. I helped him do the audition for that, it's quite funny. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else with a question? Did you notice that you might have some Yeah, that was tiny, tiny part. That's before I got Doctor Who, I... I never saw it, you know, Christmas. No. They did a series of sort of telephones, and it was one of those that just had a few lines in it. Um, I've never... What happened was I, I've been doing wrestling things, and I decided to come back to London and do some telly. And I did that. And I had a tour and I couldn't, I thought, oh, oh, I can't turn this around, I'll have to do it. I did this tour and I thought, then I'll come back to London and I will stay in the of the television. Because in England, it's terribly hard to get through the door. Once you get through the door, you can usually sort of keep churning over. But to actually get in there initially, it's terribly, terribly difficult. And in a way, it was easier for me to get Doctor Who because they were looking for somebody to play a big part than it was to get a small part of television. Um, I know that sounds sort of paradoxical, but that's actually the way it works. Because if it's, if it's not something terribly important, then I just say, oh, I can't find mate X, you know, or I can't tell, uh, you know, you know, give it, you know, give it to friends. Um, Michael Deke. Um, I can't remember the last thing. I didn't think I ever got to see it. I got to see it because really, I was on tour. I was on tour when I was on. Um, and that was amazing. Mean, that was all the thing I'd done before I stopped doing it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The third story I did was Visitation, which, as you know, was set in the 17th century. And we were out of Black Park, which is 25 miles, within a 25 mile radius of, from London, so that you didn't have to pay the crews an overnight allowance. So we're there, and we're supposed to be in the 17th century, and it's in one of the major flight paths for Heathrow, Heathrow being perhaps one of the busiest airports in the world. So you'd be sort of through the halfway between the scene and the plane would go over there, cut, sit and wait for about 10 minutes until the plane stopped going overhead, just set up the scene again, take 15, action, <laughs> it was unbelievable. Um, and that used to happen quite a lot. I and mean, eventually we started being able to go away a lot more. And, you know, we filmed Tunbridge Wells. I call it Tunbridge Wales because we were actually supposed to record the story, film one of the stories in Wales, and it turned out having to be Tunbridge Wells because we couldn't afford to get to Wales. Um, but the foreign location filming was a sort of big plus. I was really annoyed. When I came to leave, I actually left them a story before they went to the Canary Islands. I was not very pleased. I did make a point about this. I said, you know, the least you can do is bring me back a leather jacket or something. <laughs> yeah, then we lost the question. Yeah. If you've had such contact with the writers of the series, you said in five doctors you pushed for the scene to be rewritten. Yeah. Was that because they were hanging around the set, or was that just in the hands of? No, usually you actually you actually spend quite a lot of time going through the script, and in the early the first few days of rehearsal, you will find that um, you do a lot of rewriting. This is generally because you've got a better idea of what your character's about than, the, than a, a guest writer will have. Um, Somebody like Eric Stable, but he writes a script, because he's a script editor, there's generally not much trouble. Also, it's quite often holes in the plot. You know, you find yourself staring at the screen, yawning holes. And, and, and like, that's not possible because I did such and such in episode one. Um, so you've got to change the script around. And what happens is the script, you you also make a note of this change, re, you know, the rewrite, and then we'll go back to Eric. We'll go back to Eric and John, who we'll have to okay the rewrite. Usually, if it's not an outside writer, then they, they first contact the writer to see that it's all right for the writer for you to change the and they go on and on and on. Um, but that's generally the way it works. And the trouble about this, I better explain how our production schedule works, because that way things quite clear. What happens? Generally speaking, the BBC, you go filming first. Sometimes, if your director's good and, and there's time, you'll manage to do a read through of the story, which is four episodes usually. Sometimes the stories are only two episodes, but usually they're four. Um, you'll do a read through before you go filming, but generally speaking, you don't. You just go filming, which must be awful for guest stars. Because the character, you don't get any rehearsal when you're filming, you see. So your character's determined then in, in, by what you've done on the film. I'm filming, which is a nuisance because sometimes you, you, you know, after a week's rehearsal, you think, ah, oh, I could do such and such and such and such. And of course, you can't, it's too late to change it. You've already set some of the stuff down. So, what happens is you'll go filming for usually five days on vacation somewhere. Then you come back on the Saturday and you, you do a read through of, of the whole story and they time it to see that it's roughly as well. It's roughly right. And then that, the that's the only time you've ever seen the script all in one piece. Now you can imagine what it's like, because I know the Earth Shop, for instance, one, there was one 25 minute episode which had 110 scenes. So that's a lot. That's a lot of scenes. Very, very confusing. So then we all spend the next, the Sunday off, taking the script apart and, and putting it into studios, because you do two studio segments. If you've done filming, outside filming, you then do a 10 day rehearsal, 2 day studio, 10 day rehearsal, 3 day studio. And there's never enough studio time, Doctor. It's always, I mean, it's always rush, 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 rush. It's really very busy. Um, and it's all done by set. So all the time of things will be done in one, in one studio, and all, all the other things will be done with, you know, if there's a, a gallery. High council chamber, that'll be all done together. Although they might be 
and you know, three episodes apart. So it's very difficult to keep a, a tag along happening with story. And it must be very difficult for the writer, because I mean, as, as probably some of you who are trying to write probably know, there's a hell of a lot of subplotting goes on. And some of the subplots interweaving into the main plot have all got to be consistent. And I would imagine that they tend to get written separately and then pieced in. And sometimes they don't always mesh properly. And so you're stuck with a problem. I'm trying to think of an example of actually can't um, I'll, I'll see if I can turn an example later. But that's how, that's basically how our schedule works. And then a studio for 12 hour studio day or longer. When the day before I got married, I couldn't believe this. The day before I got married, my makeup call was 8 o'clock in the morning. And it took four hours to put this makeup on. That was the aging and decomposing makeup. I was in that makeup for all of half an hour. And then it took another two hours, or just over two hours, to get the makeup off. Because, because of that dreadful corset costume, I had to have the makeup down to here and down over the back as well. So it took two and a half hours, maybe two and a half hours, going down my face with brushes and soap and water, trying to get this, this makeup off and peeling it off. And uh, I looked like a prune on day of my wedding. I looked like a prune. And it also um, irritated my eyes. The latex had irritated my eyes, so I'm not. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's anybody else's question. Yeah. I think snake dance. Because I had something to do with snake dance. <laughs> yeah, because kids were written. And until snake dance was written, kids would be my favourite. I mean, part of anything else, I think Chris Bailey is quite an imaginative writer. Um, and the story was very different from anything we've done. It's very, it had a bizarre edge that, that I think a lot of the other stories didn't have. And um, that was what we have assessed that whole concept of um, uh, like a spiritus mundi of evil, uh, you know, a collective, a collective, a collective evil of a race manifesting itself in, in, in this presence. And um, they said, on what Steve John was pleased with my performance. <laughs> so they, they decided to write another story around, around that uh, particular uh, Mara. And there were some wonderful, wonderful pieces in that script and a brilliant supporting cast. They were so good. Johnny Morris, who was a young curly headed guy and very good looking, has now done two films with John Houston. You know, he played the deserter in John Houston's film, The Deserter. And uh, Martin Coombs was in that, the other young guy, the bottom guy. His father's a very, very famous actor. Martin now uh, does quite well, he's done a lot of television since then. Carl O'Neill, who's sort of a wonderful actor. Jolly cast, and they're all sort of, they're all terribly experienced, terribly, terribly good actors. And sometimes I think you get people coming into the show who are very good actors, they're very good stage actors, and great classical actors. And somehow they don't really get the style of the program because it is, it requires a, almost a style, almost melodrama, but not quite. It's very, it's very difficult to judge the level. Because in a period drama or you know, or a normal sitcom or something, there's a reality around you, like there's normal tables, normal chairs. Do you know what I mean? You have something very concrete to relate to. In science fiction you don't. And you've got to create the reality of the situation out of nothing. You know, you're looking at ten feet of plastic and you're being terrified, you know. <laughs> <laughs> requires a special sort of concentration, a special style of playing. And English actors tend to, um, I don't know how to explain this really, they sort of stand back a little bit, you know what I mean, especially because often they're very technical actors. You know, American actors are all thinking to the you know. But English actors tend to approach it from a more technical aspect. And I think that, that, that sometimes shows in their television playing, they aren't quite as convincing sometimes. So it's interesting. Um, to watch sometimes very good actors finding that, that, that particular style of acting very difficult. I mean, although that period stuff can be brilliant, I think sometimes they flounder in, in that uh, in that that genre. Anybody else interested? Yeah. Um, all around what you were saying about that style of acting, do you find argumentative series that tend to carry over in Hollywood? 
Um, yeah, it must have been that I mean, I had two weeks off when I did my job, and I found it very disorientating. Very disorientating because I just wasn't prepared for the, for the different method of working. I got, I got into a habit of working, a style of working. It wasn't a problem when I came to do some theatre because I, the, the theatre is so different anyway. That doesn't you don't tend to think along the same lines. But I suppose when you're in a similar working situation, i.e. you're doing television, although mine is all done film. I, mean, I, don't, I don't enjoy doing film as much as I enjoy doing studio. In the studio, people do a scene in a continuous segment. And, I mean, all you've got to do really is out the corner of your eye, and after a while this becomes second, second nature, is keep an eye out for the red light on camera, so that you know that you're not, you're not directing your lines over here when you're actually coming up on camera five over here. Um, it's very funny actually because I've just got to hold the back page of David Warner. And I got onto the studio floor, because uh, most of it was on film. I got onto the studio floor and thought, my God, all the camera lights are, are taped over. And they were, because David doesn't like to know where the camera lights are and he finds it distressing. I find it the opposite, absolutely the opposite, because I've got so used to it instinctively now without even having to think about it. I, uh, it's in the periphery of my vision, and I know exactly where to anchor myself. So I've got a scene where I'm like this. Now, I can deliver the line. I've never worried to ask. I haven't thought anymore, because I'm so used to it. I haven't thought to ask the director, are oh, you taking that on that camera there, or are you taking it on that camera? Do you know what I mean? Because I just used to making adjustments when I was on the floor. And I'm suddenly there, and there's no time on studio floor to start asking these questions. You should have done it in rehearsal. What do you mean? But I didn't, because I just assumed, I mean, I've never encountered anybody who's done that before. And I was thinking, I mean, you can play the line so that he's sitting there, but you can play the line to that camera and sort of do something totally different. And suddenly, you don't know, I mean, and you're playing safe, which isn't necessarily the way the camera would be shooting. In this case, there's a camera there, a camera there, and a camera there. And I, how am I to know which camera was taking me? I didn't. So my performance, you know, which I'd actually adjust on the floor to the camera, which would give it, which helps give it immediately after all that rehearsal, it's gone. And I find it really disorientating. Totally disorientating. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Time flies. I would have to be one of my least favorites. I just didn't. I thought the story was, was pretty difficult to follow. Pretty bitty. I didn't like it very much. I thought it was a bit pony, really. I mean, I had a lot of fun making it. Did anybody see Nigel Stock on Yes Minister the other night? Who played um, Who played the professor in in uh, Channel Five? Because Nigel looks as though nothing would make Nigel laugh. He looks very doer. But he's actually got a wonderful sense of humour. And he used to all, you know, he used to crack us up all the time. He spent the whole time giggling. Um, so, although it was fun to do, I didn't like the story very much. And I didn't think Paul to Doomsday was a particularly wonderful story. And the loss of us just so terrified. <laughs> because I mean, Tom is coming. Tom gets very tense on the studio floor. And will explode. And he exploded at me. And I was totally thrown. It was nothing to do with me. It wasn't my fault at all. He thought he hadn't come up on camera and he just turned around and swore at me very loudly. And I was, I mean, I was shaking. It was my first day ever in a television studio. <laughs> it, it actually, you know, it wasn't my fault. There's nothing I could have done about it, but he gets very explosive. And I, you were there thinking, oh, I hope I don't do anything wrong. <laughs> you know? So, you tend to dislike stories sometimes for very personal reasons, I don't know. I love that. I thought that was wonderful. I don't think you're a companion unless you've worked with the Daleks. <laughs> I know there are some companions who disagree with me, but it doesn't feel as though you've really been a companion unless you work with them. And they are such fun to work with. There's two guys who, who, who 
they don't do the voices actually, they just sit in the machines and, and are around. <laughs> and they've been doing it since the beginning. Oh, I can't remember their name. I can't remember their name. Uh, and they're lovely. Two really sweet chaps. And you get these mock up dialects for your rehearsals, and they're dialects without the tops on. So they're just, you know, the little um, body of things. So in lunch hour, we'd all get into the, into the dialect and say, Dalton Club. <laughs> <laughs> Great fun. So that, that was good to do. And I thought, I thought the story looked good. It looked very atmospheric. And that was also a lot of fun. There's a scene where one of the quickest changes ever, where they go, those two soldiers, one of the soldiers or two of the soldiers get taken off the dialect ship and change again. And they come back. And that doctor, Peggy and I, are trying to get, get out of escape from the, the warehouse. And they reappear. And we could, honestly, they had, to, they had to cut the scene. They had to sort of shoot at a different angle. Because we were all there going, <laughs> <laughs> We couldn't stop laughing because these two chaps were so funny. Dale and Phil were so funny and they kept on telling jokes all the time. And I had to look at them and I found laughing. <laughs> so most of it, most of you see the back of my head. If you look carefully on there, go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can anybody else ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing language. <laughs> what a talented person. Because particularly for an earthly accent. But especially as I'm speaking in our own land's language. Who did 40,000 years ago? Yes. No? That was a bit special. <laughs> it's special. And even at the convention in Doctor Who, where every girl around here, everybody speaks English. <laughs> Curious, that isn't it? <laughs> That's one of those holes for a plot I was mentioning. Um, what happened was they, they came to me with a script and they, and there was this bit like, oh, wait till the folks back home see the thing. I'm never going to look this down. <laughs> As indeed is the case. I was about to know and <laughs> My boy. Um, and what happened is they, they put together this thing and they said, this is Aboriginal. I said, what do you mean this is Aboriginal? It's like saying this is European. I, you know, there's, there's thousands of Aboriginal languages. What have you done? I mean, Kumawara, Thargalinda, you know, Kumawara. I mean, it must be something like that. It doesn't have to be cold together, does it? So I said, the most least you can do out of all respect to Aboriginal people, really, is to at least make a specific language, which is what we did. And I ran to the girl who didn't sort of put it together in the bar at the BBC one day. So, you were a bloody Aboriginal. <laughs> Searching through all these books, trying to find a language, and she came up with Tiwi, which is about as a, a language of my own So, uh, that, was, that was the story of Jantin and, and, and the... Uh, <laughs> Being Aboriginal. No, that's Castrovalva. Castrovalva, we recorded, we did the lot, and then we had uh, an eight week break, and then we came back and did a four two day um, visitation, then we had a six week break, and we did Kinder. Kinder. That's it, Kinder. It's a long time ago, isn't it? And then we did Castrovalva. And uh, so if that, that was the one where I didn't know I'd say the space part of the rest of the universe. <laughs> now come on, be honest, isn't that exactly what people in Brisbane when they're growing up say? Anybody under the age of 30 in Brisbane, what do you say? We talk around home, there's nothing to do in this town. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, it's improved a lot since then. <laughs> Well, I knew it was coming. What happened 
John owns a family office in Florida, and uh, the Americans really take it strong. They wanted to see if Tegan really liked the character, because she was quite, you know, <laughs> said a line, she was bossy. She's a bit like an American woman, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the families called Heather. She said, oh, I really like Tegan. Yeah, she reminds me of myself. She's a mouth on leg. <laughs> and now I'm American that whenever I go to the bank, they've all got these buttons which say, you know, the mouth, the mouth on legs. <laughs> all those things like that. Yeah. Brave yeah, Heart. Uh, well, that sort of, that, that grew out of trying to find, like Robert. I said it used to say rabbit. Now, that we are trying to find species that were not rude. Now, I said to them, I don't know these plants, it's very new. I've broken down and thought of people that say, oh dear, but nothing happened. And uh, so that came out of it. Like that. And then, when you break heart teeth, I, I probably would say courage to you. Know, but uh, that was the one they came up with. Yeah. Tegan. Well, te actually, well, John has a friend who's Australian, and this, and this friend has an Australian niece, and um, who's called Tegan. It's a Welsh name, I think. It means, wait for it, beautiful. <laughs> um, and. So that it was her name, and she's really missed. She is very put out indeed, because she has an unusual name. And since since the show, people have been going, oh, that's quite a nice name, actually. I quite like the name Tegan. And people have been using it. You know, mum was sort of saying, obviously, children of birth homes um, with the name Tegan. And apparently that's true in Sydney as well. Because she doesn't stop complaining now about the fact that there are other Tegans about. Yes, um, what I think about Tegan and the series. Well, Peter had seen the script before I had, and he said, wait till you see the script. I said, oh yes. He said, talk about an abrupt ending. It was too abrupt. And suddenly I did this big turnaround, happily participating in the adventure. And then suddenly I'm saying, oh, I can't take all this killing. I've got to leave. What? <laughs> I mean, admittedly, there were, were quite a lot of deaths actually in that one. And it was a bit gruesome for small. But um, it was a bit sudden, wasn't it? Yeah. I felt like saying, oh gosh, my fee has got too high, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody else want to go to the end of that? At the end of that story, you came around the back, were you wanting to go back with the doctor? No, I was wanting to get my fee a lot higher. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's supposed to be an expression of regret. Also, John wouldn't have left open in case Tegan made any sort of comeback. I wish it was sort of this year, earlier this year. There's a show in England called Jim Will Fix It, which is where basically it's kids, um, kids' dreams come true. You know, they say, right, and they say, oh, I've always want, I want to be rescued by a knight in shining armor. And they get Simon the Bomb. Sorry, not the armor. You know, yeah. Anybody, Simon the Bomb? <laughs> Simon the Bomb. You know, to come into the school and people go up and carry it off. <laughs> and this kid wrote in saying, I want to be scared by a Doctor Who monster, so they got me. <laughs> I said it before you did. Uh, so they I I did the one I did it with Colin. We did a sketch with Colin and this kid. And uh, Anyway, that sort of fuels stories that I was coming back. But in fact, it's very odd because I said to John afterwards, my style doesn't go with Collins. My character and Collins don't go well together. Because Collins is quite acerbic in his character. It's, um, you know, it's got quite a lot of bite to it. He's, sort of, he's always put, doing put down remarks and things, which of course is something that Tegan does. And so they're too similar. And when they're together, it, it tends, scenes tend to go at one level. Or that much more vulnerable character that Peter had, you know. Um, 
and that left. I mean, you could be forgiven for thinking that that, um, that Tom Bain was God in, 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 in Gallifreyan form, because there was never any question that Tom wouldn't succeed. Whereas with Pete, you got the feeling that this was a doctor who might just, you know, who could be in danger, who wasn't that vulnerable, which I quite liked actually, I thought that worked quite well. Yes, anybody else got a question? You were going to say something. The man at the end was knocking off and he was That's right, yeah. That's not that long ago. I remember seeing that one, yeah. But my stepdaughter used to watch it. But they do, I mean, it's a, it's a world championship for that. Yeah. And the idea is to get the continuous wrong. It's quite impressive. Yes, it's in my mind that I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm yeah. yeah, that ball kid character is going to be one of the most hated boys around. Because we've all seen it. We all, we oh, you've seen it here? Yeah, because we've had videos of all the other things. Naughty kid. Naughty kid. But yes, he's done. I don't have to pity him because he's not going to get, you know, all the people that say, oh, you're that kid from that show that's from Tarago. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I went to St. Louis in August, there was. That's gone all over the world, that, that Boomer, because um, and it won, there's a show called The Late Late Breakfast Show in, in the it's gone 6 o'clock on Saturday, and that won a Golden Egg Award. I think it's Golden Egg Award, it was like Best Boomer, and um, that won it. And I was speaking, I did a series later with Keith Jane, who played the young boy in it. Um, Keith's actually 190. That's true. Keith is about, it's, it, it's, it is very late 20s and still looks 15. It's amazing. Anyway, Keith, Keith did this with that Luther. And every time I showed, he had to get a warranty. And he said, I've now earned far more than my original fee just on that Luther. It has been shown so often. Wonderful. It's very funny. Do you know the Luther that he's referring to? When we were doing, uh, the, uh, which one? Awaiting. The Awaiting. Yet more green special effects line. Um, and we were around the country, down in um, Dorset, filming. And there was a scene where they, they pull up to a ditch gate, which those little gates that you see outside churches, you know, quite cute little things. And um, it actually, there had been no ditch gate there. This was a made by the BBC design department. And I had this horse pulling a cart, and the horse wouldn't stop and look in the direction of the poster and kept looking around the camera. So they decided it tempted to look towards the other horse that was on location with us. So they put the other horse the other side of the lich gate, thinking it'll stop on its mark and look that way. Well, I think it was Keith and Peter, wasn't it? Keith and Peter got down on the cart, and the horse just kept on moving and it moved towards the other horse, all right, and took the lich gate with it. <laughs> you see this lich gate going to the path of the horse. Just one more question, that's it. Now I'm turning to the photo center. Yes. Yes. Oh. If I had to handle live snakes, I would have been hysterical. No, thank God, no. Um, uh, they're all plastic of various kinds, all special effects snakes, thank God. Because there were some. Dina had to handle some, some small snakes and snake dance. They were real. Yes, they were real. Thank God it wasn't me. And, yes, no. That's right. There's a fun story about that snake. Cause on the studio floor, there's microphones all over the place, these big boom mics, you know. 
and you've got to be very careful about what you say. Because this can be heard in the gallery. The producer and director are sitting out there. So I came off the floor and I looked about and I couldn't see any booms anywhere. So I said very quietly to someone, this is the producer eating the snake. The sort of booming voice came over, I heard that. Right, it's now a photo session which is in the in the ballroom, wherever that is. Um. Those of you that want to be in the Doctor Who costume parade, could you see Fiona at the foyer, stand right outside the foyer immediately, please? Thanks.